heart that hurts I want to spend my life Mending broken people I want to spend my life Mending broken people Welcome to 3ABN Today. My name is C.A. Murray, and allow me once again to thank you for sharing just a little of your no doubt busy day with us. To thank you for your love, your prayers, your support of this ministry because we are convinced and convicted that we could not do what we are called to do without your partnership. So when we say thank you, we mean it from the bottom of our hearts because it is together that we lift up the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. So we do thank you. I'm excited today because of our program, because of my guests, or better said, family members, <laughs> and because of the subject matter that we are, are trying to tackle, to opine on, on these very, uh, this very day. I think we should call this program one in a series of programs that deal with pragmatic Christianity. Uh, you've got systematic theology, you've got doctrines, those kinds of things, you've got prophecy, all are very, very important. But what is equally as important is how do we walk with Jesus each and every day of our lives? How do we make decisions? How do we prosecute our lives? Uh, the time that God has given us, how do we make wise decisions? And how do we determine whether a given uh, course that we want to pursue is given to us by God or something that um, is in our own heart? Is that rumbling that we feel in the pit of our stomach the voice of God, or is it pizza that we ate a little late last night? <laughs> that kind of thing. How do we determine the voice of God? That's the subject matter we want to wrestle with uh, this very day on this program. How do you know when it's God leading? How do you know when God is telling you to do a certain thing? How do you amplify the voice of God and sort of turn down the volume on all of those other false voices which may be just as insistent and sometimes just as loud. To help us wade through this very important topic, we have Jill Morricone. Jill, good to have you here. Thank you so much, Pastor. It's a privilege to be assistant here. assistant to the President. Good to have you here. Ms. Molly Seenson, General Manager uh, of 3ABN and Vice President of 3ABN. <laughs> Always a joy to be here. And the Pastor of the Mayor, Marion District. Pastor Ferguson, good to have you here, man. Great to be here. He is becoming a familiar and much welcomed face uh, on 3 Ben, and it's good to have you here. He brings much wisdom and a, a nice pastoral slant to the things that we're going to talk about uh, today. I want to start uh, off with a little something, then go to music, and then we'll sort of loose you and let you go. Because we're talking about identifying the voice of God. There are times in your life when some things are very obvious. There are other times when you want to do something and you really need to know what the Lord is saying. I'll give an example. Years ago, before uh, I married Irma, she took me down to meet her parents. Um, her family, they're all good swimmers, uh, including her dad who was in his 80s, I think, at the time. He used to get on the high cliffs and dive off. They like to swim in, swim in rivers as opposed to, to the ocean, a lot of ocean, but they like fast, flowing rivers, and her dad would, in his socks, climb up on a high mountain and dive into this water. I am not, <coughs> excuse me, a swimmer, <coughs> swimmer at all. Don't swim. Irma and family are swimmers. They decided to take a rubber raft and go upstream and, and whitewater raft down. And, um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're dating someone, you try to impress them. Oh, of course. But um, they were saying, well, let's go with us, you know, and I was not impressed to do that. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I said, impression be hanged. I'm not going in that raft. Uh, they said, come on, you chicken, and that kind of thing. I said, I'll wait for you to come back. So they grabbed the, this big inner tube, and they took it over their heads, and they walked upstream. Waited 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, an hour, hour and 10. Nobody's coming down. Finally, I see them coming down, walking, no raft. <laughs> Irma's leg is bleeding. My sister-in-law's glasses are broken. Uh, my brother-in-law is bleeding. And I said, well, what happened? They said, the raft flipped over, and we almost drowned. Now, they're all good swimmers. They almost drowned. Yeah. I, a non-swimmer, we wouldn't be here having this conversation today. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You <laughs> so, did not get in the raft. Right, so to me, that was not a big handwriting on the wall kind of thing. 
dangerous, I don't swim, why would I do that? So that was not, that was not a tough decision for me. But the truth is there are times when you want to know the will of God mm -hmm. because you've got something the Lord is asking you to do. You may be wading out into unfamiliar territory, unfamiliar waters, and you need to know what God's will is for your life. Like, should I marry her? Should I marry him? Should I move and take this job? There are certain kinds of things you just need to know the will of God. And that's what we want to sort of wrestle with today. How do we identify the voice of God in and among all of these other voices which are vying for our attention? So we want to wrestle with that. Before we sort of loose you and let you go, we're going to call upon Tim Parton, a good friend of this ministry, a brother in Christ, member of the 3ABN family. He is going to be doing a song that I've tried to sing many times, but every time I get about two lines in, I, I, it makes me cry. It's just a wonderful, wonderful spiritual song. God's been good. Lately I've been looking back along this winding road to the old familiar markers of the mercies that I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche, for there's no better way to tell you than to say God's been good. In my life And I feel blessed Beyond my wildest dreams When I go to sleep each night And though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could For through it all God's been times replay and I can see that I've cried some bitter tears but I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears you see I've had more gains than losses and I've known more joy than hurt as his grace rolled down upon me so undeserved for God's been good in my life and I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night and though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could for through it all, God's been good. For you see, God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. And His love was my beginning, and His love will be my end. Oh, I could spend forever trying to tell you everything he is but the best way that I can say it is simply this God's been good in my life and I feel so blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could, for through it all,
Amen. What a beautiful song, mm -hmm. so beautifully ministered by Tim Parton. God's been good. We are talking about and dealing with identifying the voice of God. Jill Morricone, Molly Stinson, Pastor Tom Ferguson, good to have you all here. I want to set this up before I lose you by saying, in our lives, when you're trying to make a decision, particularly when you're trying to do something for the Lord, um, you've got the natural testing of the Lord. The Lord allows mm -hmm. tests to come into our lives. One, to determine for us our own sincerity, because he knows. Then you've got the natural inertia that comes anytime you're trying to do something for the Lord. You know, you're just, your sinful condition will, will try to hold you back. Then you've got active resistance by the devil. Then you've got times when the Lord is saying, no, this is not the way. Mm -hmm. So you've got a minimum of four realities that you've got to work your way through. Is this just the natural resistance that comes when I'm trying to do something for the Lord? Or is this a, the Lord closing a door? Is this a flat no? Or is this just demonic resistance? So how do you wade your way through? I'm being opposed. Is it me? Is it the devil? Is it the Lord? Is it my own inertia? Which is behind door number four, which is the real one. <laughs> uh, and we need to know that because we want to do the will of God. So how do you determine the voice of God? I've got some things here, but I want to sort of let you go and then I'll sort of chime in the next little bit. Who wants to take it off? You know, in my own experience, I was just thinking, it seems like when Satan comes, this is something that helps me when I try to make a decision or when I'm facing something. Satan's voice or voices, you know, he uses other people too to mm -hmm. push back against that. Um, his voice would always be one of judgment, condemnation, shame, while the voice of Jesus is the voice of encouragement, hope, and conviction. The Holy Spirit does bring conviction to our heart and to our life. So to me, in my own experience, because I have faced that, okay, is this something, should I not be going here because I don't feel good about this? Is this, or is that Satan just trying to bring discouragement? Mm -hmm. And I think Satan always brings discouragement. Satan always wants you to feel hopeless. Like, why do you try? You'd never be good at that. You, you know, you can't do that. Where God says, you are my child. I love you. Um, I have a future and a hope for you. So I think when I'm facing things, if I'm feeling discouraged, always know the devil's in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, we have a statement by Ellen White. I'm bringing it off the top where she says, the Lord never sends discouragement. That is not a tool, a weapon in his arsenal. Discouragement always comes from Satan. There is enough in the world to be discouraged about without the Lord sending you discouragement. So, so if you're, nobody knows the trouble I've seen as Mal often says, I'm just going to sit down and eat worms. That's not from the Lord. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not from the Lord. He doesn't send discouragement. He will correct you. He will chastise Absolutely. you. But he will not discourage you. It's not designed to do that. That comes from the enemy. So I think that's one good rubric. Uh, that we can put down. If it's a discouraging thought, if it's, I can't do it, it's not about me, um, I'm never going to succeed. That's not from the Lord mm -hmm. because he doesn't, he doesn't work that way. It's not in his arsenal. Well said. Molly. Well, I was thinking, I remember when early Christian, and people were, would say, uh, the, uh, the Lord told me this, uh, God spoke this to me, and I kept trying to hear the voice of God. And he never would speak to me. I never heard the voice of God. <laughs> to this day, I have not heard of, of, of audible, an audible mm -hmm. loud voice. So here are three little things that may help you if you're looking to get direction from the Lord. First and foremost, God's voice is always consistent with his word. Amen. Mm -hmm. it, it, he'll never tell you to do anything and then the scripture tell you something different. Mm -hmm. Always consistent with his word. And here's the thing that helped me. His voice is quiet. Yeah. Mm. He's yeah. not going to uh, speak loudly to you. It would, oh, it would be so good if he would just come sit down with you and just, uh, you know, tell you what, are you here at Molly? I want you to do this, this, and this. It's a quiet voice. It's, it's that inner witness. Mm -hmm. And the Lord speaks clearly. It's not garbled. You don't have to wonder what he's telling you. Mm. When the Lord gives you direction, it's first and foremost consistent with his word. It's a quiet voice. 
and, and we know uh, the scripture uh, where uh, he wasn't in the thunder, he wasn't in the lightning. Mm -hmm. he, he was, it was the still small voice that God spoke to. I believe it was Elijah that he was okay. speaking to. Mm -hmm. Still small voice and he will give you clear direction. You won't have to wonder what direction to take if it's the north or the south. Mm -hmm. He'll give you clear direction. Yeah, I, I like all three. Uh, history has shown that when God asks you to do something, there tends to be not a lot of gray area. Right. It's either kind of yay or nay, mm -hmm. come or go, mm -hmm. not a lot of, lot of hazy area. And um, uh, this idea that he's not going to shout. He's not going to try to speak over your television mm -hmm. set. He's not going to try to blast over your car radio. Sometimes you've got to turn all of that ambient stuff off so that you can distinctly hear the voice of God. You've got to listen for the voice of God. And then you've got to be in the mindset to accept what you're going to hear. That's it. Uh, I don't think God is under any obligation, Pastor, to, to give you information that you're going to toss in a trash can. Right. Uh, you know, if there, the first there, there, there must be a willingness to do, then you will know. It seems counterintuitive, but that's the way God will have it. If you say, Lord, whatever you show me, I'm willing to do, well, now he's on, on the, the line to show you. But if you have no intention of doing, then why would he show you something that, he's not, that you don't intend on doing? Pastor, what do you think? You know, as you mentioned, um, the still small voice, and that's First uh, Kings chapter 19, and when Elijah, actually he was in a situation where he was afraid of the voices of the enemy. Mm -hmm. And he was in hiding, and uh, God comes up to him with his still small voice and says, I have a work for you to do. First he shows him his strength, his power, but he speaks to him. He has, it gives him the assurance that he's there and he's more powerful than all these other voices. The still small voice is what uh, beckoned Elijah to go and uh, to set up kings, to call Elisha into ministry. God was not finished with him. He had a work for him to do. And oftentimes the enemy can paralyze us and have mm -hmm. us afraid of the obstacles mm -hmm. instead of the opportunities that God has for us. When I think of my, my own journey in hearing the voice of God, um, you, you mentioned earlier that we're, I can't do that, I can't do that. You, you know, I always say to myself, that's right, I can't do that. But God qualifies the call. Mm -hmm. And it's, He can do that through me if He mm -hmm. wants to. And I do not belong there unless it's the voice of God taking me there and then sustaining me while I am there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a, a journey we're all on. And I don't know how, well, as a matter of fact, um, uh, Jesus was a supreme example of that voice. And I do have a text if you'd like to. Mm. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Isaiah 50. As I was doing some study, I was thinking about this, verses 4 and 5, Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5. And this is actually about the servant, the servant of God, which he asked us all to be. Um, and in verse 4, the second half, it says, He awakens me morning by morning. Yes. I don't know if anybody else here have God wake you in the morning. That, would that be the voice of God? Because I think Absolutely. that's in line with what we're talking about. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. So, in, in other words, your schoolmaster is, is the Lord himself. And then verse 5, the Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. And verse 6 talks about giving his back to those that struck him and his cheeks to those that plucked out his beard. Mm. So it was the voice of God that led Jesus into the wilderness. It was the voice of mm -hmm. God that led him to the cross. And the reason why he was able to go through those experiences is because he had the voice of God he had been listening to his entire life. Mm. I was amazed when I see that Jesus um, sees the sanctuary for the first time at age 12 and realizes that's about him and God's call on his life. He was listening to the voice of God and the ones around him when he actually turned the tables over uh, at the, with the money changers, they were listening to all these other voices. But he knew uh, the voice of God throughout his entire life and he's a supreme example for me uh, to understand when God is calling in yeah. my life mm -hmm. as well. I like that. 
I like something you brought up, Pastor Tom, about the relationship. It reminds me, if we can go to John 10, yeah. it reminds me of that. Um, I had six keys for identifying the voice of God, and I know we'll probably discuss all different keys here, but my first one was what you had mentioned, Molly, the Word of God, mm -hmm. making sure everything lines up with the Word of God, because God's voice will never speak contrary to His Word. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the second one is the relationship, and you touched on that, Pastor Tom. John 10, this is the Good Shepherd and the Sheep. And it's interesting to me that John 9 comes before John 10. I mean, obviously, chronologically they do, but John 9, of course, is the man who was born blind, and then he received his sight. And remember, the false teachers, you could say, had instructed, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of that day, had instructed the, the people that if you had an ailment, if you had an issue, it was due to sin in your life. Remember the disciples said, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. It's that God could be glorified. But it's interesting that just after chapter nine, we jump into chapter 10. And I think there's a certain reason for that. Um, John chapter 10, verse one, most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way as the thief and the robber. And I think Jesus is saying, you have been sitting under false teachers. You have been listening to false teachers. Mm. He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And then as we jump down verse four, I love this. When he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. Why? For they know his voice. voice. So how can I think, okay, I want to identify the voice of God, but how can I identify the voice of God unless I know him, mm -hmm. unless I know Jesus and I'm friends with him? You know, if you're in a crowded room and there's a lot of noise and all of a sudden Greg talks, guess what? I can hear his voice right. because I know and instantly I recognize or identify his mm -hmm. voice. Or my office is down the hall from, you know, the, the door at the end there and when my boss, Danny Shelton, walks in, sometimes I can hear his voice when he walks in and I think, oh good, he's in the office, I gotta catch him and ask him to do this and that, because you recognize somebody's voice. And I think that's key in identifying when God speaks to me, I have to fall in love with him. I have to mm -hmm. know him intimately. Mm. Well said, you know, the Bible says, asks us to let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. There are certain prerequisites to hearing of uh, the voice of God. I was watching a National Ge Geographic special once and uh, it was talking about penguins hearing their, the call of the, the parent penguin. And you've got half a million birds all squawking, but they can pick out, mama can pick out child and child can yeah. pick out mama uh, because you become attuned to that voice. Uh, the Bible tells us that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So you must have a spiritual mind if you're going to undertake to do spiritual things. Um, um, Ellen White says, she said in Review and Herald, this is August in 1888, that there is no need to try to exercise yourself in spiritual realms unless you have the Spirit of God animating that exercise mm. and directing how it's done. So you need to have God's direction and God's plan. Uh, and if you don't have them, then you're not sure you're on the right, you're on the right track. You've got to be accustomed to hearing the voice of God, which, which presupposes that you are prayed up before you begin to act up. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to be prayed up. You've got to talk with him and open up that line of communication so that uh, when, you know, you've got to watch and pray. Because if you're watching and not praying, you'll see it and miss it. If you're praying and not watching, when it happens, you're not ready to act. You're not ready to act on it. So you must watch and pray. Then you'll be ready to act on what God shows you to do. Mom. You know, Psalms 4610, mm -hmm. be still and know That's that I am God. It, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, and I hope this isn't true for you, but um, it seems like the busyness in my life mm -hmm. uh, keeps me so preoccupied and there's so much to do. Mm -hmm. And um, what I need to do, I'm just going to speak for myself, is fix my receiver mm -hmm. to get still, to be still, yeah, and, and put myself in a position to hear that still, small voice. Mm -hmm. I get my ear attuned, and how do you do that? It's, you know, spending time. There is no quick fix. There's no easy, quick way 
for you to put yourself in right relationship with God and get your heart prepared to receive, it takes spending time in His presence. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, we are such a, a quick fix people and we are so busy. Mm -hmm. Pastor Ferguson, are you ever too, too busy? Do we ever? Never, never. What is that? What is, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we catch ourselves at times uh, just rushing from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. There has got to be time and the best time in the world, and boy, am I speaking to myself, is that er those early morning right. hours mm -hmm. where, and I think it was you that said earlier, at four o'clock in the morning when you wake up, the enemy wouldn't wake you up and tell you to pray at four o'clock in the morning. That's gonna be God yeah. telling him early, that er time of early morning prayer when you're the freshest to spend God in his presence and to spend time in God's presence and allow Him to speak to your heart, spend time in His Word and, and let the busyness of this world just melt away Amen. and spend good. time with Him. It's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking too that everyone who is in ministry and we all are ministers, when you are ministering, it, it is God can be the voice of God to someone else that yeah. needs that voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And unless you're in the, the condition that you just stated, it's impossible for you to be a minister that day mm -hmm. or that moment. Um, I wanted to look at John 10 again and because there's a couple other things that I saw there too that were pretty neat. If you go to verse 2, it says, to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. Mm -hmm. Do you know who the doorkeepers are when I study that out? His disciples. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that is really neat. Uh, God has a calling for us to help others hear the voice of God. Do you ever wonder if there's one voice and everyone thinks they're following that voice and there's 30,000 plus denominations out there and we're all thinking we're hearing his voice. Um, I just recently was in a, uh, officiated a funeral and I heard a lot of different voices out there as to what is happening with that individual right now and yet we're opening the same Bible. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what voice are we listening to? And one of the things that I, this fi I find very encouraging, if you go down to verse 16, um, you, first of all, he says in verse 14, I know my sheep and am known by my own. Mm -hmm. And other sheep I have, verse 16, which are not of this fold, so them also I must bring, mm -hmm. and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Recently, I had someone tell me that we're on a, going to attend a church two years ago, and it was going to be their first and their very last time they were ever going to go to a church. Oh, wow. But God had been calling on their lives. They didn't recognize it was the voice of God yet, mm. but He had been working with them, and they, that was their testimony. He works on us before we know Him personally. He draws us. And uh, when he went to that church, it was a beautiful sermon. There was an altar call, and he found himself standing in the front of the oh, church. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't missed church since. Mm. So the voice of God in the beginning, in the early reign, is it has a converting effect. And the voice of God, as we continue, has a sanctifying effect, turning, making us like Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the key indicators for me. If it's the voice of God, it's either drawing us to Him, making us more like Him, usually means we have to sacrifice maybe what we think is best yeah. to what He knows is best. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's, that's key. But yet there's still a lot of confusion in this world about the voice of God. And uh, for instance, when two Christians disagree, mm -hmm. Where's the voice of God mm -hmm. in that situation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we, we should always remember, uh, with few exceptions, God does not make, and I'm thinking of rather specific circumstances here, God will not make an exception for you mm -hmm. to a established biblical principle. We should not be unequally yoked. Um, mm -hmm. but he's handsome and he's got a good job and he treats me nice and she's gorgeous. And so God is going to give me a pass because um, God wants me to be happy. In fact, I have a good friend, uh, a Korean fella uh, who is Presbyterian and he works seven days a week. He works all day. He, he owns three dry cleaners. 
-hmm. He does his own books, his own accounting. Mm -hmm. He banks his money himself. He opens them himself. He closes them himself. He has a degree from the Culinary Institute of America. He cooks for his family. So when he leaves the dry cleaners, he goes home and his family is sitting at a table waiting for him to come and cook. Bless him. <laughs> then on Sunday, he sings in the choir. He cooks for the church. And I told him, when you are rest? going to die. <laughs> you, you can't keep up that schedule. What he says, my, I like money and mm -hmm. uh, I work seven days a week to have money and that makes me happy and God wants me to be happy. That's his, that's his theology. Um, uh, but you're killing yourself. You know, he's getting old, he's getting old fast. Um, so he thinks God is gonna make an exception to health laws for him. Mm -hmm because my family needs me to cook. So they sit with their hands folded waiting for me to come home and cook. And they're just sitting at the table waiting for me. So God is gonna keep me while I, while I just butcher these health laws because I'm the exception to the rule that if you burn the candle at both ends, you're gonna burn the candle out. God doesn't do that. That's right. God doesn't do that. He's, he's, he's sincere, but he's sincerely wrong. And um, there are doctors who, who, who own yachts and Mercedes and big mansions because people think that they can abrogate health laws, and God's going to make an exception just for them. That ain't so. Mm -hmm. So God's not going to make an exception for you. You've got to follow those laws and principles that are laid down by the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, people who have, have heard the voice of God and ignored it, they know it. Mm. Right. Yeah, it. It doesn't escape them. And I just wanted to kind of address that because mm -hmm. um, God will redeem that. He can redeem, if you spend time with him and, and um, put yourself back in right relation with the Lord, although you, you know that he spoke to you and he gave you direction, told you not to do this or to do this, and you ignored that, then uh, you find yourself in a situation, maybe a bad situation. And although your circumstance may not change, God can redeem you. That's right. And so spend time with him. Uh, he, will, he will reward your devotion. That's what he will reward. Mm. And so don't, don't put, and, and I just wanted to ask, have you ever said to yourself, I knew I shouldn't have done mm -hmm. it when I did it, mm -hmm. but it was the practical thing to do and you were being pressured to do it, but there was just this, this knowing in your mind that I am about to do the wrong thing, but it seems so right that you did it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing because, I didn't mean to cut you off, Mom. No, no, not at okay. all. Um, it's amazing because I think that we, we say as Christians, oh, I struggle hearing and knowing the voice of God, and there are times that we do. But I think, in my own experience, more often than not, I struggle obeying the voice of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I struggle following what I know God wants me Amen. to do. You read Pastor Tom in Isaiah 50. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that one, in the end of verse Verse five, the Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. But how many times does God call for our heart and say, okay, Jill, I want you to step out in this decision. I want you to do this. And I say, but it looks too hard. It looks too big. I don't want to do that. Or it goes against my flesh, my own desires. And so then the I price. say, I don't want to do it. Yes, go ahead, I'm mm. sorry. Yeah, just don't want to pay the price, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's a great point, Molly. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I wanted to give, and I'm sure all of us will, uh, examples where the Lord spoke to me and it wasn't, again, it wasn't that verbal voice and, and one of them is just, just practical how to make right decisions in the ministry. Mm -hmm. And the other one does have a, more of a spiritual connotation to it. But uh, I remember one time the then uh, production manager came to my office because they were having a bit of a issue on the set and what it was, and I'll, I'll explain this as carefully as I can. Uh, we had two gentlemen, they were, um, physicians, I believe it was from Andrews University, and they were giving an illustration or instruction on how women were to, uh, to check themselves every month, check their breasts every month for um, uh, lumps, mm -hmm. which is a very practical thing for us to learn how to do. And so what they had was a, a, a mannequin, a dummy, and uh, that was, uh, it, what, it was very modest, but they still felt like it could be, it could be 
uh, misconstrued. Yeah. And they all, they also wanted my hands because they were women and they didn't want to show a man. That's right. And so they were going to use my hands. But they said, you know, wh what can we do to make this even more mo modest? Well, this was asked me in my office. Well, as I was coming through the lobby, the word blurring was dropped into my heart, or blurring, came to my mind, wherever it came, and blurring. Well, I had no idea what they were actually gonna ask me, but when we got out to the set, there it was, what can we do to make this more, more modest? And I said, well, isn't there a thing called blurring that we could do? They said, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> well, see, I knew I didn't think of that. As, that's right. So was that the voice of God? It sure wasn't me. Mm -hmm. So I think the Lord, see, how that's just practical. God mm -hmm. giving you instruction mm -hmm. on, on what to do. And then uh, in Sabbath school, oh, this was maybe four or five weeks ago, uh, a lady, her name is Maria. She is now here. She is a, a volunteer, a wonderful volunteer here at 3ABN. Well, she was from another area and she was reading her Bible and uh, heard a, uh, a sermon by her pastor and it was talking about God setting his families in flocks. And um, she that just really dropped into her heart. You mean the solitarian families? Uh -huh. Well, okay. I've got the scripture here. Okay. It's Psalm 68, 6. God sets the solitary in families. Mm -hmm. It's Psalms 107, 41. Mm -hmm. Makes okay. families like a flock. Okay. God sets the solitary in families. That's Psalm 68, 6. Well, she was reading that scripture and then uh, the sermon and she said, you know, I want to be part of a family mm -hmm. and 3ABN is my family. I'm a mm -hmm. part of the blessing is on the go and I'm part of the family already. So I'm going to go down to 3ABN and volunteer and see if this isn't where the Lord is directing me. She felt so strongly that God was directing her in that area. So she came into Sabbath school class and she came a little late because she had a little difficulty getting to the church. And just as she walked into the classroom and sat down, now this scripture wasn't in my Sabbath school lesson. It just, the Lord strongly impressed upon my heart for me to use this scripture uh, in one of the examples that mm -hmm. I was using. So I told her, so I was speaking to the class and the Lord tells us in Psalm 68, 6, God sets the solitary in families and that was the very scripture wow. that God had impressed upon her heart mm -hmm. when she said it's time for me to, you know, to go mm -hmm. volunteer at 3ABN. So that was an Ill, a, 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 where God impressed upon my heart to put, put that scripture into my Sabbath school lesson. And did I know that the Lord was speaking that to me? Well, I was hoping he was, because I always pray and ask the Lord to, to help, Lord help, when you're putting a lesson together. But one was just a practical uh, example here of something we do here at 3 ABN. And one, it really helped that lady know that this really was where God wanted Amen. her. But you know what that's an example of? Is that is God using you to speak and share the voice of God into someone else's life. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. because as we come before God and we look at the scripture and we want to walk and surrender whatever God calls for us, whatever he wants us to do, but at the same time, God uses each other. God uses people mm -hmm. to speak into other people's lives. Yes. He can say, Pastor Tom can say, you know what, Jill, the Lord has put this on my heart for you. And you know what? That could be the voice of God coming through someone else Very sharing. True. Very true. Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, in a corporate sense, when the majority of the church is listening to the voice of God, worship happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you ever wonder how people from so many different backgrounds that mm -hmm. view life so differently uh, could come together and have unity and peace and worship? I have prepared sermons and I say, Lord, I don't know what your people need to hear today or this weekend, but you do. Mm -hmm. And please put this together. Amen. He puts a message on my heart. I put the message out on paper and then I open up my quarterly and discover the Sabbath school lesson is the exact same theme. Mm -hmm. Then someone comes and does special music, they sing a song that is right in tune with the theme. Oh, yeah. Someone does children's story and it fits right in with the theme and none of us had a conversation beforehand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when the voice of God is in control of his church, there's unity. I think about what is when, when we no longer have sin and we're spending eternity with God and pre and post sin, everyone was listening to the voice of God. 
-hmm. Self was crucified, mm -hmm. and God was, his voice was, was driving things. And that's all he's calling us to, again, as a church, is to allow that to happen. And he's going to work through us, as we allow it, to, to actually have transformational effects on others. It's a blessing for us as it blesses others. Mm -hmm. But the voice of God must reign supreme in the Christian's mm -hmm. life. And that's when we see mm -hmm. uh, mountains move and yeah. we see the hand of God in everything. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well said. You know, yesterday, no, just a couple days ago, I guess, um, on Sabbath, Pastor John Lomacain was preaching, and um, I'm always blessed when he ministers, but for some reason, this Sabbath, I was especially ministered to, and Greg and I are sitting there in the pew, and all of a sudden, he shared something that as soon as he spoke, it was just like, I don't know how else to explain it, it was just as if each word just went straight Amen into my heart and it was what I needed. Mm -hmm. Now he didn't know I was struggling with something. He didn't know there was an issue in my life. And then as soon as he said that, the Holy Spirit said, Jill, that is what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't even know what I was dealing with. I didn't even know what the issue was. I just knew there was something going on, but I couldn't identify it. And when he spoke, the Holy Spirit used him. Yes. And the Holy Spirit spoke conviction to my heart. And then I could go back and say, oh, Father, thank you for showing me what's in my heart. And I repent of that. And I ask that you would cleanse me, give me clean hands, as Molly always says. Pure heart. And a pure heart. And so praise the Lord, he uses mm -hmm. each one of us to speak a word into someone else's life. Amen. Life has convicted me of the following. One, that if you are willing to be led and used of God, he is more willing to lead you and use you than you are to be used and led. He is very willing to give you and quite able to give you good gifts and to direct your steps. Um, Second Corinthians chapter eight tells us first there must be a willing mind. Mm -hmm. So before you even ask to be directed or to be used or to be led, you have to say, I am willing to be directed and yes. led. And that opens the way for God to lead and to use you. Um, a pastor came to the pulpit with a mind that was willing to be used and led. And so we know one person that he was used to bless and that was you. Mm -hmm. And of course there, are, there were many, many others in that, in, that, in, that, in that congregation. So if you want to know the will of God, God wants you to know That's his right. will. He is not trying to keep anything from you. Uh, what is it, Amos uh, 3 says, surely the Lord will do nothing. Uh, and of course, that, that's talking about big things, but even in little things, in little, should I go, should I not? Should I spend this, should I save it? Should I stay home and wait, you know, or should I go to the store? Even in those little things, God is willing to, I don't think there's anything that comes against us or that we deal with that is beneath the notice of God. Amen. He is as willing to be involved in as intimate of the details of your life as you're willing to allow him to be involved in those intimate little details. Where are my keys? God cares about that. Mm -hmm. I got to get to work. I need to find my keys. Lord, I need to find my keys. You'll find your keys. You know, he's, he's in, and, and the thing is, and I'll say this quickly, if you are accustomed to bringing the Lord into your life into little things like keys, when the big stuff comes, like you go to the doctor and the doctor says, that's cancer. Or the doctor says, we don't know what that is. We don't know how to treat it. You don't lose your religion or your mind because you've been walking with the Lord over those little things. So when the big stuff comes, you know where God is. You don't have to go searching. It's too late to go find God in the rainy storm. You find God in the sunshiny day mm -hmm. so that when the storm comes right. and the lights are out and there's nobody to direct you, you walk that path. I am a male over 50. I get up at night and go several times to the restroom happens when you get over 50. I never put on the lights. First of all, it disturbs Irma. So I get up and I know the way. I don't bump into anything unless there's something there that got left. I know how to go into the bathroom, do what I have to do, wash my hands, put the towel back, and go to bed in total darkness. Why? Because I have radar? No. I've done it so many yeah. times. I've worn that path. So now when something comes that I'm not ready for, I know where God is. Amen. I don't have to say, Jill, could you show me Jesus? I know Jesus. I can find them for myself. I've walked that path 
during the sunshiny day. So now that when the clouds come, I can make it there because I've done it all the time. So you, 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 you bring him into the little things, and then when the big things come, you know the voice because you've heard that voice so many times. Mm. If we have time, I just want to share too. I wonder how many people missed out because they said no to the voice of God mm -hmm. to the point where with Zechariah, um, they refused to listen. And that's Zechariah 7, 11 to 13 and Jeremiah 6, 10. Who will listen? Mm -hmm. God's mm -hmm. pleading. Who's going to listen to me? Mm -hmm. It took the Lord five years to call me to the literature work, to be a literature evangelist. And I kept saying, no, I hate salesmen. I don't like them. <laughs> and poor Ron Wooten, the publishing director, I'd come into his office and hit one objection after the other. As a matter of fact, after 14 years in the literature work, I never heard anyone else use all of the objections I used on that one man <laughs> trying to get out of the work that God kept calling me to. I had my own ideas of how it should be done. Um, and I just kept saying no to God. But finally, I did it. The Lord bless. He took me on a path that I would not have chosen, but it, it actually prepared me for what I was about to do. Mm. He called me to success, not failure, if I just mm. let him have control. What I've learned over the years is, um, you know, when I was called to, to Michigan, uh, it was three times to go to Michigan to do the literature work, and I said no twice. Oh, wow. The third time, I decided, okay, Lord, I will check into this. And um, when I went to the publishing director's office, I said, I need a house before I leave, a place for us to live. If this is God's call, he'll, he'll provide a place. Within four hours, I had a place to move to. <laughs> then uh, a year later, I was called to leadership in Illinois in 1994. And that call, I knew in the heart of hearts, I had such peace about it, this is exactly what God was calling me to. All along, I could see that he had a plan. It got to the point now where this last district I was in, we were there 10 years, which for Adventist pastors is a long term. <laughs> And there were things that had happened in times where I thought, Lord, is it time to go? Is it time to leave? And because I was starting to the point, I was getting to the point where, yeah, I'm ready. But he wasn't ready. Mm. Another year, two years, three years went by. And when it was time, uh, you know, you don't, you never want to say, yeah, I'll go, bye. You know, <laughs> you want to say, I'll pray about it. Mm -hmm. And I did pray about it and I had total peace and it was to come to this district. Mm. And one of the thoughts, fleeting thoughts, was, Lord, it's kind of crazy, but it just, uh, do you actually want me to be on 3ABN at all? Is that part of your plan? Mm. And here I sit. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been saying, I've been kind of digging my heels in the whole time, not wanting to go this direction. But I realized, Lord, if it's you, mm. you're going to give me peace. I have learned over the years that uh, try to get in step with the will of God, get all those other voices out, wait on Him. Mm -hmm. Don't, it's really bad when you get behind him and when you get ahead of him. You want to be in step. And getting in step with God uh, is, I think it takes experience with him and he, he's patient. He works mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. He'll develop that in us um, so that we actually, um, as, as Jesus says, he does nothing that uh, the Father has not revealed to him. His plans are laid out. Amen. God directs his path. And that's, that's the goal I have in my life, that God directs my path. You know, I think you hit on a very uh, wonderful point, and that is wait for peace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't get ahead of God. Don't get behind right. God. Mm -hmm. Just wait for the peace of God to umpire in your heart, yes. to mm -hmm. rule in your heart, mm -hmm. and then it's time. Amen. And that was the same scripture I was thinking of, too. That's incredible. <laughs> uh, as you were sharing, Pastor Tom, we're glad that God brought you here. And that's yes. just a wonderful thing. The scripture I was thinking of is Colossians 3, 15, and let the peace of God mm -hmm. rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body and be thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And I think when Greg and I were making the, the decision, should we move forward? Should we get married? That's one of those pivotal life decisions. And God had led and we had peace. And then we came to a impasse, like a time of difficulty. And I believed one way about a certain thing and he thought something else. And for us, it was, uh, I'm not talking scriptural or doctrinal. This was just other stuff. And um, he said, well, I don't think this is going to work. And so we had a long distance relationship. And I remember he said, well, let's pray about it, Jilly, and um, see what God does. Mm. And so I went to bed in Massachusetts. He was here in Illinois. And I remember praying and saying, God, well, I just don't see how I can. And I surrendered. God, I don't want my will. 
I want yeah. your will mm -hmm. in this situation. And there were two issues. So the one issue, say the first issue, he changed my viewpoint entirely, God did. And after I was through praying, I knew instantly Greg was right and I needed to yield on this point. Mm. But interestingly enough, on the other point, I felt like, no, that was right, and I still needed to hold to that. Well, the next morning, Greg called me, and he said, well, Jilly, I prayed, and I have peace over these issues, and this is how I feel. So the issue God had changed me on, Greg still held to, and he felt firmly about. Mm -hmm. But the issue where I was still holding firmly, Greg said, oh, God changed my mind on that. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I view the other way around. So to me, we knew then, when we had that assurance and that peace, mm -hmm. that then you can move forward. So I think anytime we're facing those decisions, to know that if we're walking in step with Jesus, in line with him, we have that peace Amen. that comes from above. Amen. Well said. In Matthew 11, um, the Lord tells us that uh, he hides some things from those who are wise in their own sight and reveals them to children, which says to me that understanding the will of God is not a matter of intellect or wisdom or even acquired knowledge. It's, it's a matter of having childlike faith and trust Amen. to do and accept whatever God shows you to do. And Ellen White buttresses this by saying that our effectiveness in the world is not a matter of us making a big noise. And she used that term, a big noise. Our effectiveness and hearing the voice of God and carrying out the will of God is in direct proportion to our surrender to the Holy Spirit. So your mind has to be surrendered. Your heart has to be surrendered. All that you are within has to be surrendered. And if you want to hear the voice of God and are willing to follow that voice when heard, you will hear the voice of God and the Lord will be more than pleased to direct your steps. We're going to go to our news break now, then we'll come back, put a little bow on this with some closing thoughts. And that is good information. We want to sort of put a little bow on this. Uh, I'd like to get a closing thought from each of you, just a little something to sort of sum up uh, your thoughts. Jill? One of my favorite scriptures, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. That promise is sure. Come to him every morning. Spend time in his word. Submit and surrender your life and heart to him and watch as he directs your path. Molly, well done, Jill. Well, I'm just thinking that there are those that uh, do find themselves in a situation where you've, you've missed the voice of God, you've not been obedient, and God will redeem your mistakes. And always remember 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive, forgive us of our sins. And He and goes cleanse. that one step further. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness, which puts us right back in right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. John 18, 37, those who are of the truth hear His voice. So it's true that each one of us can hear the voice of God, but we must be willing to submit our hearts and our lives to Him, spend that qualified, quality time with Him, wait on Him, and He will direct your path. The one that has begun that good work in you will continue to complete it, and He is calling us all to Himself, to a place that He knows and we need to trust him to take us there. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well said. He that cometh unto the Lord, God will not cast out. I'm right. looking at John 7:17. 7, if you choose to do, then you will know. You make the choice to do, God sees to it that you will know. Ellen White says uh, in her messages to young people, there are three general ways in which God speaks to his children. One, by his word, the Holy Scriptures. You always want to go to the word of God. Two, by his providential workings. If he wants you to walk through a door, he will open that door or give you the ability to push that door open, but you will be able to move through. And three, she says, appeals of the Holy Spirit. So we should pray for the Holy Spirit, surrender ourselves each day to the movings and wooings of the Holy Spirit, give yourself to him early that day, put your life in his hands, and he will be pleased to show you what to do and how to do it and guarantee your success. Well, our time has fast slipped into eternity. Allow me now in closing to wish you both grace and peace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye and God bless. <laughs>